Uh, good morning and welcome everyone to the 26th meeting of the Local Government and Communities Committee in 2017. Can I remind everyone present to turn off mobile phones and as meeting papers are provided in a digital format, tablets may be used by members during the meeting. Uh, well, we've got one apology today. Our Deputy Commissioner Elaine Smith unfortunately can't be with us and she's uh, given her apologies. Uh, so with that noted, we'll move straight to agenda item one. Uh, on city region deals. So the committee will take evidence on its inquiry into city region deals and with several witnesses in front of us this morning. So can I welcome uh, Councillor Susan, Susan Aiken, Chair, Glasgow City Region Cabinet and Leader of Glasgow City Council and Kevin Rush, Director of Regional Economic Growth, Glasgow City Region Deal. Particular thank you to Kevin for uh, taking us through some of the Glasgow City Deal stuff uh, yesterday uh, on a committee visit. I'm sure we'll, we'll come on to that at some point. Um, uh, also welcome Councillor Adam McVeigh, Leader, City of Edinburgh Council, and Andrew Kerr, Chief Executive, City of Edinburgh Council, Edinburgh and South East Scotland City Region Deal Partners. Uh, Councillor Graham Ross, Deputy Provost and Leader of Inverness and Area. And John Robertson, Programme Manager, City Region Deal Highland Council. Uh, Councillor David Ross, Co-Leader, Fife Council. Uh, Councillor Jenny Lang, co-leader, and Richard Sweetnam, head of economic development, Aberdeen City Council. Thank you to everyone for coming along. It's a pretty large panel of witnesses we have today. As I've previously indicated in private, my apologies if we have to uh, restrict speaking in terms of maybe only allowing one person. So if there's two of you from the, the, the one city region deal, we might have one speak rather than both. Or, or if there's a specific question about one city region, not everyone necessarily has to come in and answer that. Just I want to give everyone a reasonable opportunity to to have their say today. So we'll move straight to to questions, and I might just open up with a kind of a general point, but then leading to maybe a, a, a request for some specific information. So last week, um, this committee heard there was a, a kind of contrast between if you like a UK government approach to maximising. Uh, economic growth from city region deals or a Scottish government aspiration to have a balance there, including uh, uh, inclusive growth is, is the expression used. So I'd be very keen to know from each deal, each deal at different stages of planning and implementation and delivery, if they could perhaps give an example of a project that has been, is being or will be delivered that looks at inclusive growth and particularly how that will be monitored and what the benchmarks for that are. So I wonder if anyone would be keen to open up on that. Councillor Aiken. Um, thank you very much, convener. Um, yeah, I think this is something that's been um, very much a topic of discussion at the Glasgow Region Cabinet recently. Um, at Glasgow, obviously, was the, the first deal developed. Um, it was developed back uh, originally in 2014 um, when perhaps um, ideas around inclusive growth were, were much more in their infancy and, and they've, they've developed much more and have become um, a much um, more integral part of, of thinking, um, particularly Scottish government thinking since then. Um, so we um, have specifically agreed at, at the last cabinet uh, to seek um, the advice and support from the Commission for Urban Economic Growth, which is chaired by Professor Anton Muscatelli, um, about how we can uh, evaluate and judge the, the Glasgow region programme as a whole and the individual projects within it um, on inclusive growth criteria um, and, and to understand how we can, uh, what kind of measures and criteria we can use to evaluate the projects as we scrutinise them as they're, as they're going forward. Um, and the, um, so my, my colleague Kevin Rush is working very closely with Des McNulty from the Commission uh, to um, develop those criteria just now. But I think particularly we want the, the eight council leaders, the eight politicians in the cabinet uh, to have a very clear understanding um, as we go forward scrutinising the deal, what what um, inclusivity means, um, both in terms of economic growth, but also um, in terms of uh, equalities and human rights within um, individual projects, but also the programme as a whole. I think a particular project, and it's the one that the, the Commission is focusing on um, to uh, to evaluate uh, is the Canal and North Gateway project in, in Glasgow, which involves uh, a very significant amount of house building in Site Hill, um, a whole lot of work um, really to, to build a new community in South Hill, Site Hill. It isn't, it isn't just homes. And I think that one has been identified as 
having um, a, a perhaps certainly to begin with the, the one that has the clearest uh, route towards um, being an inclusive growth project and one that's focused on inclusive growth, on building uh, long-term benefits for uh, a community in a part of the city that has uh, suffered economic disadvantage for a long time, um, making sure that uh, the, the economic growth that is delivered as part of that deal is inclusive, has a long-term impact for people um, and, and for that part of the city in terms of uh, jobs in terms of creating high quality, uh, decently paid jobs in terms of ensuring uh, the skills development so that local people are able to access those jobs and ensuring that the community that develops and is built as part of that is a community that um, supports uh, a reduction in inequality um, over over the long term. So it's early stages that the, the um, Professor Muscatelli's commission is looking at that, but I certainly think that that um, the, the cabinet is um, extremely uh, keen to to follow um, and to, to learn from their conclusions on on um, the site hill project but also more widely to ensure that um, broader criteria around um, inclusive growth are are part and parcel of everything that we do going forward on the, the city region deal Okay, thank you. And the Councillor Day, can you have to soften up a committee convener, given that that's all in my constituency? <laughs> um, but the, within that, there's maybe an admission that um, the city region has perhaps embarked on a number of projects that maybe inclusive growth wasn't at the forefront of, of, of the mind. So whether that would be the Merchant City development with the opening of uh, the Four Million Centre at Taunty. I'd be interested to know how that would fit in with inclusive growth. Uh, or indeed, the, my hobby horse when I used to be a regional MSP was the Cathkin Relief Road, but I just couldn't get my head around where the inclusive growth benefits are that way. So you don't have to comment on those individual projects, but it's somewhere within that answer. Um, would it have been better? So, for example, I know in my constituency, you know, take the opportunity, Councillor Aiken, to mention this, that there may just be some additional funding required in terms of drainage and infrastructure from the city region deal to reali realise the aspirations that, that you said so eloquently at committee. And we've heard about a retrofitting of the city region deal, so I put that on the record, Councillor Aiken, but somewhere within your answer was an admission that some of the projects that are now complete, actually, may not have had inclusive growth at the forefront of their minds. I think it's, it's fair to say that... Uh, in 2014, um, the economy was different than it is now, um, and perhaps the, the drivers and the thinking behind um, the, the city region deal that was developed at that time um, I don't think it was. Um, I don't think it would be fair to say. And I, I, I wasn't there at the time, so I'm. You know, I can only speculate about what the people who were involved in it then were thinking. I don't think it would be fair to say that there was no thinking about inclusivity. Um, I think that everyone uh, had at least. Um, at, at least we're at least partly thinking about a long-term impact on inequalities um, being at least at least one of the outcomes that we'd want from this major investment. What I I think it is fair to say though that um, it wasn't perhaps a front and centre in the strategic oversight and the strategic thinking about how the, the deal and the entire programme was put together. I think that's also partly because thinking around inclusive economic growth has moved on since then as well. Um, and, you know, I think the Scottish government's uh, in economic strategy in 2015, which had um, inclusive growth at, at its heart, obviously post-dated the, the Glasgow City deal. We do now have an opportunity, though we're two years away from the first gateway review on the Glasgow region deal, um, and the the Commission for Urban Economic Growth is there as a, um, as a tool and a, a source for um, advice and, and monitoring um, and indeed direction, uh, if need be, on ensuring that inclusive growth is absolutely part of those projects. I think, though, um, just to pick up on one of the ones that you mentioned, um, the Tontine building, I think absolutely um, if we if we use the Tontine and the opportunities that it provides in the right way, it absolutely can be part of inclusive growth because it, it is about um, supporting SMEs um, and within that there are opportunities for growing skills for, um, it, you know, it's, it's mainly in the, the digital and tech sector. 
we then as a city region have to respond through um, the way that we organise our curriculum in schools, for example, through the way that we um, we ensure that you know young people make their educational journey, that they have the skills available to them in order to access the jobs that are being created through the um, the startup uh, opportunities in the town team, for example. For Councillor Aiken, and what we're in danger of being we just centric here, I think. So we better move to other deals. And I've made my plug in relation to the likes of Postle Park, Hamilton Hill, Sight Hill, Rock Hill, who could really benefit from some of that city deal money for inclusive growth. So I've made that plug directly to you. But, but, but Scotland's a big place. It's not just Glasgow. Let's move on. Who else like to tell us about inclusive growth within within their region deals? Uh, Councillor McVeigh. Yeah, um, I mean we are fairly early on in our stages, so we've just approved our governance structures, we're moving on to our project management arrangements um, and getting formal approval for both those. But I think it, we probably have learned a bit from the process as this has developed as a partnership between regional and local authorities and both respective government, uh, governments. And I think there has been an understanding of the strand of work and part of that is I think the representations that Edinburgh's made and I'm, I've only been council leader for four or five months. Um, so I can't take all the credit, uh, but there there was a sense that actually to deal with the to generate the growth in Edinburgh and then the consequences of growth, if you like. So a big part of our city deal is on skills, linking to the innovation money in the universities and the centre of excellence and all that kind of stuff, but also housing um, and the model that was created, quite specific, quite tailored in Edinburgh, was about not only providing a mechanism for the local authority to build homes which would um, address some of the pressures caused by that additional growth, but also create it in a way where there's a revenue stream from that new from those new rented properties, which the council can then invest through our housing revenue account into new social homes. So the multiplier effect has been built in such a way where the skills should link to the centres of innovation, should link to the, the new economic activity that we generated and better link those communities that traditionally haven't been enfranchised with those economic opportunities in the region and the city, but also dealing with the consequences of that growth and providing an, an accelerator multiplier effect so that everyone literally benefits down the line. Edinburgh ring-fenced the, 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 the monies that will flow from that growth, whether it's additional business rates or what have you. Has Edinburgh ring-fenced that specifically for those projects? No, so we've we've created a, a model, essentially, it'll be a new housing company, and the housing company will generate additional revenue, which will go into our HRA. So the um, our, our housing revenue account, um, obviously, has our social homes, has rent, um, that has its house building programme anyway. What we've managed to do through the city region deal is create a housing company with £50 million from the Scottish Government. That's going to build one half thousand maybe maybe more um homes for rent and it's the additional revenue beyond the borrowing costs that will go into the hra account and manage to build more social homes kind of at the source of the hra so uh, the multiplier and, and dual um approach i think has been helpful and it's worth noting that that was managed to be done for 15 million pounds rather than actually the city region deal providing the full capital cost of that that's very helpful. Thank you, Councillor McVeigh. Uh, uh, Councillor Ross? Yep. Uh, as you'll be aware, the Highland Council area is, is bigger than Belgium, bigger than Wales, uh, which uh, gives us a, a different uh, sort of uh, sense of proportion in terms of some of the, the, the deals that are going around. Uh, we have to try and ensure that inclusive growth covers the whole of the council area, uh, from things from Thurso to Lock Harbour to Inverness. Uh, some of the things we're involved in is a Science Skills Academy in Newton Rooms and Keith Ness and in Lock Harbour to try and improve uh, opportunities for young people and to, to include them in uh, the opportunities there. Other things like uh, we're the Highland Council or the Highland area has a, a, an ambition to be the best rurally connected uh, uh, council area within within Europe, and we're trying to develop new digital Wi-Fi and so on throughout the, the council area. Other things like affordable housing and uh, yeah, uh, innovative things like the uh, the fit houses as well is trying to include people in, in new technology uh, to ensure that we provide services for people across the, uh, the council area. Thank you. And Councillor David Ross? Just, just a couple of things. Um, I mean, I think, like, like Adam, um, clearly the, the Edinburgh and South East Scotland city deal was built on the two pillars of one, accelerating growth, but also uh, tackling inequality and, and um, 
poverty as, as, as well. So I think that, that has been built in. I, th I think the two, two points I, I would make, I think it, it's, it's probably a mistake to look at too closely at individual city region deal projects or the city region deal in isolation from other things that are going on. And, and in this aspect, I mean, particularly in Fife, we had the Fair of Fife Commission on a long-term approach to tackling uh, poverty and inequality, and that very much fed into the process. I mean, that was 2015, and it's fed into the process, and other local authorities that we worked with have had the similar. Uh, so there's a number of things. Also, I mean, in terms of, you know, one of our focuses in terms of inclusive growth is some of the, the areas that are lagging behind, particularly mid-Fife, uh, where we've also had, um, in the wake of the Tullis Russell closure, the, the Fife Task Force, um, with um, Lennon co-chaired at, at one stage with John Swinney and myself. So that that has put things in there. So there's a lot of other things going on. Just the the final point, going back to your first question about is there a difference between the UK and the the, the Scottish governments on on this? Um, I think I, I would. The, 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 the issue that's occurred to me on that is much more that the UK government has focused on what it sees as reserved matters and hasn't, in my, my mind, actually grasped the idea that it's all integrated. Uh, and I think that has a wee bit overbalanced, certainly, the, the, the Edinburgh and South East um, Scotland, Scotland regional deal a wee, a wee bit in, in terms of... Um, where that focus is, because that's been focused on mainly the UK government funding on the university sector, which is predominantly in Edinburgh. It's not necessarily a bad thing, but I think it has overbalanced that a little bit. OK, it's worth saying, Councillor Ross, that that difference between Scottish and UK governments wasn't the view of this committee. It was the view we heard from witnesses quite strongly last week, but that's very helpful. Wonder, Councillor Lang, do you want yes. to? Um, thank you. As far as our deal goes, we've obviously built our deal um, from our regional economic strategy, but within the regional economic strategy, inclusive growth is very much at the centre of that. So we feel that you know the projects that have come forward as part of our city deal, um, you know, do have those um, inbuilt in them as well. So um, we're a wee bit ahead of some of the the, the cities that are sitting around the table, um, particularly our oil and gas technology centre. And although um, on the face of it, when you look at it, it's obviously about us, the diversification of our economy and building on the expertise that we've built up over the years in oil and gas. Um, it's also about the education impacts as well. And we're seeing that very much coming through in the projects about how they can relate not just with our colleges and universities, but also with our schools in the city um, to give that um, you know, impetus, impetus and input going forward. The harbour expansion is another one where they're benefiting from uh, the infrastructure on shore as part of the deal, but very much part of uh, the contracts that are coming forward is that community benefit and making sure that jobs are going uh, to local supply uh, companies and uh, and things like that. So um, within that, I think we can see the projects, although they're around the diversification of our economy, actually having an impact on the inclusive growth um, throughout the city and the region. Um, the other aspects, I mean, I mean, I think I would agree with Councillor Ross about, you know, there is this definition between devolved matters with UK government and uh, Scottish government. We saw that with ours as well and the things that we put forward initially, perhaps not getting the funding. Um, however, we do have some projects or uh, money put on the table around our transport aspirations and connectivity um, going forward. And that's obviously about us trying to open up uh, the region for both um, commercialisation, but also um, for housing as well and the infrastructure that's connected with that. So I would say that we, we do see that inclusive growth, but we do need to monitor it. That will be the important thing going forward to see the benefits that are coming out of the project. And I suppose that's maybe the importance about having a framework of how that is actually analysed and looked at going as, as we move forward. And I think it's important that both governments um, collectively come together to see if we can get a framework that goes across the whole of Scotland so that we can be analysing the deals um, and making sure that the outcomes that we're trying to achieve are, are actually there. I expect you're, you're moving us nicely on to the next question in relation to monitoring, but just before we do move on, can I just check something? You said, Councillor Lang, because my understanding was that these city-region deals were to be local authority-led. 
you know your communities best, you've got your own local regeneration strategies. I'm disappointed to hear, irrespective of where the fault lies, that there'd be a tension between what is reserved and what is dissol uh, uh, devolved. These are local economic strategies and 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 you mentioned, I think, somewhere down the line, there was some suggestions that the Aberdeen deal put forward that were not accepted because of issues between reserved and devolved. I caught that somewhere in your answer. Could you maybe give an example of I that? I think we obviously had a range of um, projects that, that we were looking at. It's not because, obviously, I mentioned there both about uh, the transport aspects and the digital connectivity, both of which have actually come forward with funding, probably not as much as we would have liked at the time, but it will enable us, hopefully, to bring those projects um, when we get to the, the next round of deals. But I suppose our deal was based really about the innovation <laughs> side. So when we see those projects coming forward, particularly the Oil and Gas Technology Centre, the Biotherapeutic uh, Innovation Hub, and indeed the food and agricultural uh, innovation hubs as well. The funding has come forward for those. And that's probably because our regional economic strategy was at the heart of the deal that we were putting forward. Um, and, you know, but we would hope that both governments will, as they've put money on the table around the uh, transport uh, appraisals that we'll do, that both governments will come back and, um, when we are, we're looking at projects going forward. I mean, we, we'll ask uh, both governments whether they've said no to any projects coming from any, any, any region deals, but just for clarity, uh, did either government say no to one of your specific projects? Well, we had, a, we had a number of, I mean, we had almost £2 billion of projects on the table and we've got funding for £250 million as a result of that. Um, so what I would say is there was a number of projects where both governments were looking for further analysis of those, further uh, evidence that those projects should be taken forward. That's obviously what we need to try and do now. What I would say is what we've seen, uh, you mentioned there about it being up to uh, local authorities, they know their priorities priorities best in bringing those projects forward and I would agree with you. I think the difficulty that we've seen um, particularly around some of our transport uh, projects is that other aspects at a national level are kicking in there. Transport Scotland, for instance, have asked us to perhaps delay um, uh, bringing those projects forward for a year because they want to see the effects of the Western Peripheral Route. Now, we would argue that yeah, it's very important that we, we you know, obviously do take into account uh, the impact of the Western Peripheral Route, but we need to be carrying out that appraisal work as we move forward so that we're ready and in a position to bring those forward once we can see the impact of that. Another aspect was around the d digital connectivity, where again, we had uh, you know, very set ideas on where we want to make that investment. The Scottish Government quite rightly are rolling out a programme throughout Scotland, the R100 programme, and they asked if we would look at that. Now that has delayed us four to six months because of that, and in actual fact, we've determined that that isn't the best way forward um, for us to put the resource, and we are pursuing uh, the initial um, areas in which we wanted to do that. So I think there'll always be that um, competing aspect, but it is important that we're making sure that we're putting forward localised opinions on that, because as you mentioned, I think we do know our, our cities and our regions uh, the best. I think that I accept that, because that was a pitch for blockages and delays to be mitigated rather than saying, no, you couldn't do a project. Uh, can I just check? No, no need to answer if the, if the answer is no, we haven't been told we couldn't do a project. Has any other region deal been told, no, you can't do a project? Yes. Mr I mean, Robertson. I, there, there is a process, and I think it's common for all the city region deals, which is uh, you will look at your local priorities and put forward a range of projects, and that will exceed... Um, the, the sort of the, the necessary amount of money, so that there is a. Mr. Robertson, because there's lots of funds that are like that, but local authorities are, are usually asked to, or, or city region or local, we have to rank those projects in, in order of priority. If every fund is always over prescribed, that, that that's not the same as saying no to a project. Right. Okay. So that th that was my angle, which is that there is a, a long list which gets cut down. I thought that's the question you were asking. Right, but I mean, I mean, it, it would be re right. No one's indicating that no has been an answer. I just wanted to check that that was the case. We'll, we'll move on. We'll come back to some of these issues. Unless I'm just checking, Councillor McVeigh. Well, I, I mean, we did have a transport project that we were keen as an organisation, and I think we had other regional partners who understood the value of it. 
that wasn't progressed, and that was tram. Um, and it wasn't progressed by either government, despite the fact it looked like there was a time where the UK government might have found itself in a different place in terms of its funding appraisal of, of that, but that was very clearly ruled out. Um, that is a matter of regret, because it was a high-capacity public transport solution which could have unlocked uh, additional um, economic generation within the region in line with the aspirations of the, the wider city deal. So um, that is certainly one that that was off the table and not permitted uh, by either partner, actually, uh, to be part of the project mix. That's helpful. We can pursue that further in, in, in later evidence sessions. That, that's the kind of thing I was looking for. Uh, Graham Simpson. Thank you very much, convener. Um, I'm going to focus, um, if you don't mind, on uh, Glasgow. So mo most of you are off the hook. Um, Councillor Aitken, um, I'm just going to quote um, some things you said um, in October. Um, you said the city deal is very 20th century. There's lots of stone, steel and concrete. There needs to be a focus on what jobs will be created and how these jobs will be accessible. We need to have the courage to say no to some of these projects. We need to think what happens after we build the infrastructure. If we can't see uh, what we have to have the courage to say, that the project doesn't go any further. If we're not satisfied, we need to make changes. Uh, now, I find myself in the unusual position of completely agreeing uh, with an SNP politician. Um, couldn't agree more with you. So have we had, given that you've said that there needs to be change in some of the projects in the Glasgow city deal, have any of the, any of the councils in the city deal uh, said they will want to remove some of those projects? Um, not remove projects at the moment, but certainly, um, I, you know, a term I've used is, is re-engineer. Um, look at the projects and look at the um, the detail within them and the the kind of the elements that are making up the project. And just as I said before, assess that in the, in in the uh, in the context of um, inclusive economic growth, in co in the context of the long term economic benefits, in the context of the potential for leveraging in. Um, private sector investment, which is um, is a, a deliverable of the Glasgow City Region deal, um, we're expected to bring in uh, an additional 3.3 billion um, in, in private sector um, investment um, over 20, the 20 year period of the deal. But in actual fact, I think we, we would we have an agreement that we'd like to do it much more quickly than that. Um, so in all of those kind of all of those criteria, um, I think there is a there is a re-evaluation across the programme um, and all the, the local authorities are, are saying, OK, how are we doing on this at this stage? How are we doing on these things? Where is the potential for these longer term aspirations and ambitions? Um, I obviously can't speak for, for the other local authorities, but I can tell you certainly in, in Glasgow, um, the, the team in Glasgow is absolutely looking at um, not just the the projects within um, City Deal, the City Region Deal, uh, but wider, and I'd go back, I think you know, Councillor Ross said this, uh, none of these sit in isolation. Um, all the other uh, projects that the, the Council um, is pursuing or has aspirations to pursue and looking at how those all fit together um, and, and trying to, to look at them as a whole rather than an individual, um, okay, we're going to build this over here, we're going to build that over there. How are these things all linking up? How are they contributing to um, aspirations, ambitions around skills development uh, um, and, and skills growth, the growth of key sectors, um, em employment sectors, and, um, and and skills sectors, innovation. Um, you know, so we have, for example, in Glasgow, um, the two innovation quarters that the um, Strathclyde and Glasgow University are are developing, um, which are not 
directly part of City Deal, but have very clear links in to a lot of the work that's going on in City Deal. So I think a lot of the work we're doing is about trying to identify all of those connections and make sure that we are exploiting those, that we're maximising the benefits that we can get from all of those connections. Um, and uh, I, yes, I would expect that there, are, there will be some areas where we um, perhaps try, we, we, we focus funding and focus investment on a particular area. If we, if we look at something in a project and say, this appears to us, us to have real potential around skills and jobs and future jobs, um, particularly for parts of the city and communities in the city um, who have not had access to that in the past, then that's where we focus our efforts, focus investment. Um, that's the process that's taking place just now. We have, um, obviously there are, um, you know, we, we, we have to be very careful. It's that, you know, we, we do, it is written into um, the governance structure allows the cabinet to ultimately make a decision and say, you know, if, a, if a, a business case comes to cabinet and they're not satisfied, then, you know, actually it's incumbent on us to say it doesn't, it doesn't progress if we, if we don't see um, either value for money or, or longer term benefits. We are not at that stage in any of those projects, and I would emphasise that. Um, but, uh, you know, something I've said in the past is a kind of shorthand way is just because it so happens that within the programme there are a number of bridges have been identified as being built. But the question is, where does that bridge go to? Um, right, OK, it goes to Govan, but what's going to happen in Govan as a result of that bridge. So that's that's the, the process that's going on just now, and it's going on um, in quite a lot of depth um, and with a recognition that there's there's an in, a window of time that we really want to get this work done um, so that we can, we're not delaying projects moving forward. Okay. Um, so after, after you made those comments, uh, Alf, Alf Young wrote, wrote in The Times um, there'd been an early emph emphasis on infrastructure. The instinct was to unwrap projects that had lingered too long unrealised in council in trays uh, and that is indeed the fact um, uh, particularly in in South Lanarkshire the convener uh, mentioned the Cathkin relief road um, uh, I was uh, at, at, at the opening of that uh, in, in February uh, the then deputy leader of South Lanarkshire council uh, Jackie Burns said it would improve infrastructure to employment areas across Rutherglen Glen and Camber's Lang. But uh, I can tell you when I walked the route with Councillor Burns, there were no employment areas on that route or nearby. Um, so I can't see the benefit of that road, 21 million pounds. It shaves five minutes off a journey. And I think that's the point the convener was uh, trying to make. Uh, a number of road projects uh, in South Lanarkshire, put forward through the city deal. Stuartfield Way, um, Green Hills Road um, in, in, in East Kilbride, um, neither of which, um, neither of which uh, have been presented with any kind of business case, um, no traffic assessment produced for either. Yeah, it's still in the city the deal. Question. The question is, um, are you uh, I mean, there are projects in North Lanarkshire as well, road projects. Are you actually seriously re-evaluating some of these projects? Well, I'm... North and South Lanarkshire are the lead authorities for those. Um, I also I, I should emphasise I wasn't part of... I wasn't there at the time when those projects were chosen. Um, my colleague, Mr Rushlow, is in, um, the, leads the, the project office for... Um, the city region deal. He might be able to um, shed some light on those those specific projects. Um, what I would just finish by saying at this point before I hand over to to Kevin is, um, I suppose my concern at this point, um, having inherited um, the deal three years into its, its progress, um, is that as we move towards the first gateway review for the Glasgow deal in two years' time, um, that we are taking every opportunity available to ensure that if the inclusive growth aspect hasn't been engineered in in the past and hasn't been thought about that we do it now before we progress much further. Um, so that, that's very much my focus as, as the chair of the cabinet now. 
Mr. Russian, it's worth noting, uh, Graham Simpson mentioned the Catherine Relief Road, I think, ten years before it was constructed, uh, a business plan showed it would cost £7 million. Ten years later, it cost £19, whatever million pounds. So value for money uh, and effective delivery is very important. How are these things monitored within the city region deal? So there's, there's an extensive um, value for money process that we go through for all projects, and I can't, having not been involved at that time, I can't answer the, the difference over those two periods. Each of the projects that made up the Glasgow City Region deal wasn't to be viewed in isolation. So I think that the point, I understand the point you're making about the Cathcan Relief Road, um, but the projects, although they would generate GVA growth in terms of access to jobs, sometimes they had to be seen as part of the wider programme to, to realise that the full benefits. So there are ones that may be seen in isolation that don't look as if they're going to generate substantial growth, but when allocated next to the other 19 projects as a programme when the modelling was done, they did generate generate um, some of that growth. And each of the projects that was selected for the for the Glasgow deal, we went down initially from, from 80, as you say, down to 40 and then to 20, was put through a pretty rigorous process uh, to ensure that value for money, to ensure that it was going to be a return on investment in terms of, of economic delivery. And some of that economic growth won't be realised until all of the projects are completed. That That's another issue to note. We can't view them in isolation. The other point about some of them was that in relation to the earlier discussion about inclusive uh, growth. I don't think it was called that back when the, the city deal was, was developed, but improving access to jobs in the bottom 25% was a key criteria for, for how projects were selected. So if, if two projects were broadly similar in terms of their economic impact, if they increased access to jobs from the bottom 25%, then that meant they were, they were more prioritised. So I, I understand the, the point that you're making, you know, when you look at one project in isolation, but as part of an overall programme, they were modelled to, to deliver that economic growth. Mr Simpson, you have a follow-up question. After that, we will move... To, again, we're not, this is not the Glasgow committee. I'm conscious of that. We want to ask about other... We will return to Glasgow, but we want, want to ask about other region deals as well. Do you have a brief follow-up to that, Mr I can Simpson? make it. I can make it in general, and anyone yeah. can jump in, actually. Okay. Um, because the, I mean, the basic point uh, that I, that I'm making um, is commu communities have have not been involved. Uh, there's been no actual case made to communities of how they will benefit um, from these particular projects. So I think that goes for all the city deals that you need to involve. You need to involve people and not just tell people what you're doing. They need to be involved from the start. So what plans have you got to, to do that? And that's very helpful. It's a good opportunity to put on the record, Mr Simpson, that it was actually Monday we were we were in Paisley as part of the Glasgow Airport plans. And we heard whilst there had been significant consultation with groups on occasions, it was after decisions were made, not before decisions were made. And I think that's a really good point. Um, so, Mr Rush, do you want to add additional comments before we take in other, <coughs> other witnesses? I, I think... Um, I think that there is an issue there that, that obviously that you'd mentioned, convener, the, the feedback that had come from committee uh, from community consultation. And I think, as, as Councillor Aitken says, we are now looking at how we can augment and improve the, the projects in the Glasgow context. And I think we would give a very firm commitment that we would have full consultation with communities before any changes are made. Just very briefly on yeah. that, um, convener, if it's OK, just to say that the... Um, and again, it has been after the projects were decided on, but I would say that the... Um, the consultation and, and, and consultation is almost too small a word. The, the genuine engagement with communities um, in uh, the Canal and Site Hill area, for example, in Glasgow, and also on um, the Sucky Hall Garnet Hill project in Glasgow has been very, very good. I think has been of a very high quality, actually, um, and and worth looking at uh, for and, and using as models for going forward. Um, so, the while the and again, you know, if we if we were could go back to 2014, it might be done differently. But you know, the projects at the time, uh, I think absolutely, it's fair to say that there wasn't public engagement around the choice of of the projects. But in terms of the detail of the delivery of of um, projects and the impact that they will have uh, on local people, uh, certainly the the ones that are most advanced in that respect in. Glasgow as a city, I would say that the levels of public engagement have been um, of a very high quality. Uh, uh, other examples of, of consultation, uh, before I bring Jenny Gorruth in shortly, because I know she wants to explore this further, any other examples of consultation ahead of decisions been taken, or what's the level of community engagement that we've seen across the, the various region deals? Councillor David Ross. 
Sorry. Uh, I, again, I think it's this issue of looking in isolation at a city region deal. Uh, in the, I think our deal proposals have been built up on the back of a whole range of things, local economic strategies and such like, and those are the things that, as a council, you know, we have taken from discussions with communities and consultation on 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 um, you know the five plan and, and our economic strategy, and put some of those in that meet the you know the criteria. So, I, I think you can over you know over egg the, the the point about consultation with communities. The scale of of these kind of deals makes it very difficult to involve individual communities at that level. However, that doesn't mean you know they haven't been and some there hasn't been ongoing discussion on on some things and uh, about that and I, I think uh, Jenna would be quite keen to come in at this point but I will to everyone else in to discuss you know what level of consultation they've had but Jenna go Ruth. thank you convener and good morning to the panel um, Adam McVeigh in the Edinburgh submission you say the confidentiality surrounding the negotiation process has meant that local politicians and the communities they represent will have little understanding of the deal until the heads of terms are agreed I'm not necessarily sure I'm there yet as a local politician and, and the heads and terms were obviously agreed for Edinburgh on the 20th of July. But with regard to that specific point that Graeme Simpson made in terms of transparency and public engagement priorities, you also say on page 17 in your response that for the Edinburgh City Region deal, there have been several awareness raising events, including a launch in August 2015, at which over 300 people attended. Have you any idea who was there? I think Andrew could probably answer the specifics because yeah. it was third sector, I think local community groups were there, a lot of businesses. Um, I'm, even from that, there's been a lot of events that have happened um, post, so a lot of conglomerates of uh, businesses and things like that looking to see how they can not only influence the city deal, going back to that element of um, consultation, but how they can best respond to it to maximise it. But Andrew might be able to give more... Um, specifics. Try. I've mean, got it working now. Um, yeah. Uh, hello, committee. Um, I so uh, at the at the actual launch itself, there was that mixture that Adam just described. So we we tried to get represented from the community, but also the business community, and also key organisations that were there since then and before the deal, before the heads of terms. We've done a number of uh, both communication to and discussion with various community groups right through Edinburgh before we got into the negotiation on the heads of terms at yeah. all. I appreciate that. Were any of those groups, though, from Fife specifically? Do you know? Um, I can't remember the, the specifics, but... Um, so I believe that was right across the region. Sorry. Each other, I, I, I think it would be helpful if, if one of you could say what level of consultation there was outside the city of Edinburgh, which I think is the underlying point. My, my recollection of, of that event was that there were in, invites to uh, a range of groups from across the whole region. Um, certainly, I believe, you know, our, our Chambers of Commerce, um, I believe the, the, the Small Business Federation in Fife representatives there, um, and I think a number of third sector organisations, the, the CVS, I think. Specifically, is I'm concerned that communities in Fife were not consulted. And David Ross, obviously, you allude to uh, certain different organisations being involved, but communities themselves, how did they feed into the deal? And how were those priorities identified for the Edinburgh deal? Because it doesn't feel that um, the community's priorities, and my constituency certainly, have been listened to. And I would like to hear a wee bit more of, in terms of how you, I know, had some sort of consultation with them and identified the priorities for the deal. Take that. Yeah, I mean, it goes back to what I was I was saying. Uh, rather than specific consultation on the, the 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 deal, there has been a whole range of of consultation on the five plan, uh, our economic strategy, uh, and such like. And and that, as, as you know, I mean, is going down now to a very local level. There is a lot of um, discussion with local groups around the five task force groups and Tullis Russell. 
um, particularly in employees and, and other community groups there. Um, there's the in instance of the, the charrette that's just been carried out in Macedonia, you'll be aware of, which, again, we would hope would, would play in. And one of the, you know, the key issues that is brought up time and time again in Glenrothes, for instance, is the ageing infrastructure, uh, the, the sites and premises that need renewal. And that is an absolute key part of that, that our submission and one that we've got you know, funding for in, in that city deal. I'm really hoping there's a Macedonia and Fife. There is, there is. Right, OK. Do you He's not making it up. He's not making it up. I want, I want to, I want to bring... Uh, I'll let you back in later, but a brief follow-up just now, Jenny Ruth, and I want another region deal to come in and comment on I've got a kind of specific point with regard to the Fife deal, so if you want to bring other people in... We'll come back and maybe look at okay. that later. Councillor Lang, in terms of the consultation process, what's the engagement been like? Um, I think, you know, obviously share um, other opinion around the table. The, the way the deals are structured, the actual consultation prior to the signing of the heads of terms is very difficult because, you know, there's that level of confidentiality. But I would agree with Councillor Ross that ours, because it's based on our regional economic strategy, we obviously had consultation with various groups around that. And our regional economic strategy is feeding into the local outcome improvement plans that we've uh, drawn up and the level of consultation that we've had there. But um, moving forward, I think we obviously, once we've got the projects, it's important that we get that community uh, involvement at that point. I mentioned a couple of the projects that we had initially, and the harbour development, I think, is a prime example of that, and the impact that that's having on, on one of our uh, most deprived uh, communities within Aberdeen. So it's important that we make sure that the local people there have an input into that project. They have the opportunity to see, you know, what employment opportunities may be there, but also looking at how that will impact on their communities. And we've set up uh, groups within that where there's direct liaison between themselves and the Harbour Board and obviously our officials around that. Um, the communication strategy, I suppose it's it's about, we, I mean, we obviously have two councils and we have the private sector as part of our governance structure. Our committees are obviously public, uh, the papers are there for people to see, but we also have a joint uh, communication protocol as well, where we try to go out as a unit um, into, you know, whether it's business communities or indeed uh, the wider uh, sectors when we're holding public meetings and things about the deal, and we have everybody um, at the that and uh, having an opportunity to obviously give that information out and obviously take in uh, information from those that are present. And is, is that an ongoing process? Would you write to the chairs of all the community councils or residents associations or, or small or, or chamber of commerce or whatever and say every two or three months have a have have a meeting just to just to update what, what what's the ongoing up a strategy for updating and after that's one of the things we heard in Paisley where we thought Initially, there had been good engagement and it was reasonable, but they wanted to make sure that was prolonged, ongoing and meaningful rather than a series of one-off events. Yeah. I, I would agree with you, particularly because most of the projects that we're talking about here around the table are long term. So we want to make sure that people are being kept up to date. We have a newsletter which uh, it goes out. And, and, and as I mentioned there, you mentioned a few different groups. We have community council forums within the city and Aberdeenshire um, and trying to get that information out. I suppose it's easier for us in the city perhaps than it is for our partners in Aberdeenshire where they've got a, a much wider spread within the communities. But it's also, I think, important that local councillors are well aware of what the uh, implications of the deal are so that they can obviously be spreading that when they're out into their communities as well. So I think we all do have a role to play in that. But I think the fact that we've got a joint communications protocol helps us to do that and make sure that the information is being disseminated across the, the region as a whole. Councillor Graham Ross, I don't know if you want to say a little bit about communication strategies, engagement. In, in terms of communication strategy and engagement, I think John would be able to give us much more details in that respect. But certainly in some of the, the, the Egypt projects that have been going on, there's been a, a variety of communications going on with the, uh, the Chambers of Commerce, uh, Community Council forums, local councillors, local uh, economic development plans. Plus the, each uh, agency has its own strategy that we've to tried to work uh, to to sort of dovetail with the information there. So I don't know if you want to add to that, John. Yeah, I mean, in terms of the background, I think the, 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 there was deal-making within the city region deals, which is sometimes we had to be fleet of foot and things were quick. But I think the point about ongoing um, engagement and communication is the key thing. 
So if we had asked about some of the projects we didn't get through the long list, we wouldn't be talking to those people. It's more important that we understand how to shape the projects going forward. And similarly to uh, the Aberdeen City Region deal, we have a, a communication protocol. Um, and one of the key things, and it relates to the other point, is if we want to see the benefits of the projects combined, the synergies between the projects, we need to speak to people about inclusive growth. And inclusive growth wasn't necessarily a, a major part of our deal either, going back to the early conversation. It's a maturing process, so we've had to build that in and look at that. We've had to look at equality. We've got had to look at the economic development. So it's having the conversations with the right groups and right down to the community level within it has to be an ongoing process. Okay, thank you. Um, we'll, we'll move on now, Alexander Stewart. Thank you, convener. Good morning, panel. We've touched on the, the importance of governance. It's already been mentioned in some of the responses. Uh, but I'd like to try and expand that a little bit more and talk about the strengths and the weaknesses of the, the whole governance process going forward. You know, we, we, we've talked about the engagement of communities and the business community and, uh, and how that progresses. There's opportunities for bureaucracy and the avoidance of that uh, and the whole accountability assessment and how that is managed going forward. So, you know, I think this is a very important role that we need to think about. So can I maybe ask if you can expand on what you think are the weaknesses and the strengths of the governance of this process? Okay, governance of the process. Who'd like to... This is not a keen panel desperate to come in and answer these questions, I have to say. Over governance, I expect you to be on the ball with us, quite frankly. Uh, Mr Robertson, you've caught my eye. Well, what I would say is that it, it, it's some, it, the early stages are described as a process without a process, so that some of this is we're developing it as we go along. So when we put the deals in, when we looked at the, um, the way you put a business case, how the business case would be judged, that's something we're working in partnership with the Scottish and UK government as opposed to having a set of key criteria with all the, the detail behind it and what we need to meet. There is the five case business case model in terms of the governance. Does it pass muster in terms of a business case? Um, and there is an expectation that we will have a government arrangements which we write into the city region deal. So I think we're in a, a, a fairly good place. We, it's, we've got the scrutiny panel from the Scottish and UK government. We've got uh, our own government arrangements and we report to committee. But it's been a process of development. It's not something that said, here's the book at the beginning and this is the governance process we expect you to follow. Uh, did, did you see within that answer what the governance arrangements are? What are the governance arrangements? So, in, in, in top down, I guess, or from the UK and government of Scottish government, there's a thing called the Scottish City Deal Delivery Group. Right. So, so that, would that not be their monitoring of you? I'm asking yeah. what okay. your monitoring is so and I, your corporate governance. I was going to move down to that. So, yeah. within that, we we are one unitary authority in the, our city region deal, so we don't have to have a cross um, council board. So, our uh, EDI committee, what's the Planning and Development Committee, has an oversight of the city region deal. That takes reports from the programme board, and the programme board looks at all the projects within the city region deal, including the partners. So some of our projects are run by UHI, by HI, and we all report to the same programme board looking at progress against timescales, progress against um, uh, cost profiles, and reporting against our risk and issues and our ability to escalate them. And then each of those um, projects has its own project board that meets to look at the issues and escalate up as necessary. And does that information find its way into the public domain? Yes, it's publicly available. Right. Okay, that's helpful. Uh, Richard Sweetnam. Yes, thank you, Convener. Just, just to add, um, in, in terms of the strength of the governance around the Aberdeen City Region deal, um, the Joint Committee was developed as the deal was being um, negotiated, and I think that's been um, uh, helpful because post-implementation, we've had the Joint Committee, it's in, in, in year two now. Sitting below that is a programme board, which involves you know, national agencies um, and, and local partners in the private sector. But the other strengths from, from the, the governance perspective has been the decision-making has been quick, um, the pace of the projects has, has um, um, benefited from, from the private sector input, um, and, and it works well in, in terms of, of governing the implementation of, of the Aberdeen City Region Deal. Thank you. Um, I was just getting in, information uh, from the clerking team there, just putting the public record. Uh, I believe Audit Scotland are doing a piece of work at the moment in relation to governance of uh, city region deals, which was lurking in the back of my head somewhere, but I think for anyone watching this process, 
that's a good thing to put in, in the public record just now. So governance procedures and, and other city region deals. Uh, Kevin Rush. Um, yeah, I, I think from from a Glasgow perspective, I think we are we are satisfied. I think there's very robust governance measures in place. We have a, a structure, obviously led by the the cabinet, which is the eight leaders, a chief executives group which sits underneath that and meets on a four-weekly basis, a lead officers group that sits under that and a series of support groups. We ask all of the projects to submit four-weekly status reports um, against spend delivery and to highlight any issues. Um, we are hated by the member authorities for that because that is an incredibly onerous uh, piece of work, but, but it's required to, to do so. And obviously that is reported in to, to Cabinet, which is publicly available information. Uh, we ask them to do that not just for the infrastructure projects, but also for the labour market ones and innovation ones as well, which gives us an overall, through the programme status report, an overall picture of, of where we are at any stage. Uh, this may be a little bit unfair on... Uh uh, Glasgow City Region, because you're, you're the most far advanced, but you're, you're given a fairly clear scrutiny process and monitoring process there. Are you able to give an example of where things were not going as planned, but that process identified the issues and rectified it? I think, um, and apologies because I see Nick Young from uh, Scotland office in the, the audience, um, the Working Matters programme is a, is a good example of that. So Working Matters is the, it's not one of the infrastructure projects, it's a labour market programme. Um, where we're working with some of those uh, furthest from the labour market. It's a £9 million programme for people on, on ESA. And what we've identified throughout it has been a real issue in terms of getting referrals through, not just from DWP, but also uh, from member authorities. And that process of reporting into Cabinet, that, that was reported as read. We were able to highlight at a very early stage what the, the issues with the, the programme were. Cabinet took a decision to write to the Minister to try and put in place an action plan to, to rectify some of that. So that's a, a kind of live example of how that, that reporting mechanism has enabled us to, to change how a programme is delivered. And as a result of that, what we've managed to do is negotiate with the Government an extension to the programme, which might hopefully enable us to to reach more, more people. In terms of the infrastructure projects, we haven't had as many issues just yet, just with the nature of where we are in, in the, the programme. I would anticipate that as we, as we develop, that's something we might see come through more often. OK, and I'm losing track of which region deals have told me about their or, or told uh, Mr Stewart about the monitoring processes. I mean, Councillor McVeigh. We, we are very early on, and I'm hoping that our governance arrangements will be formally <laughs> uh, agreed in, um, in the next 10 days or so. Um, we have a monthly leaders' meeting of all the local authorities that oversee everything, and then the CEOs of uh, chief executives of the councils meet once every fortnight to go through uh, and monitor progress. Um, and we've, we're in the process of setting up our project management office, which has outlined timelines so they can be held uh, accountable for those timelines, for those processes. But the nature of, and every city deal is different, the nature of our city deal is that a lot of the projects have an obvious lead. Um, and those individual projects fit within those natural governance frameworks anyway. So the work that we're doing in West Edinburgh, for example, the obvious lead is Edinburgh as an authority, and those projects fit within our natural governance anyway. So there, there are structures and layers, and we've made sure that all our projects fit in with the UK Government's Green Book Assessment as well. So there are standards that we've made sure are in all the layers of projects that are in uh, our deal. And then there are um, essentially different layers of accountability and scrutiny that's put on that. OK, any additional comments before I bring uh, Mr Stewart back in? OK, Alexander Stewart. Thank you. Uh, you've identified that each deal is different and that they have different complexities. Uh, but going forward, I mean, these are long-term deals that we're looking at. Uh, and when you send from the governance, you then come on to the scrutiny and the value for money and the appraisals of making sure that that's processing through. Can I ask how you've identified that? and what processes you put in place to ensure that you have that value for money and that you have that opportunity uh, to examine and appraise uh, and the risks that are, that are being identified going forward because of the long-term nature of the projects. Councillor Aiken. Um, Glasgow, again, has, has the most um, experience of this. The, 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 the process that um, Kevin described is, is entirely about that. It is entirely about um, that ongoing scrutiny um, and, and monitoring value as, as we go forward. And certainly um, the, the cabinet, the leaders, that, that is the focus and the reports that we get, which are detailed reports um, on, on each project and on, on the programme as a whole, uh, we are able to very clearly identify and it's flagged up for us um, if there are issues and the working matters 
um, project that, that uh, Kevin described is, is one where the Cabinet has been vocal in, in saying to the, the Programme Management Office, we want action in this, we have serious concerns about it. Um, and that that's entirely what, it, what, what the, the governance is about, value for money, long-term benefits. Um, I think perhaps one thing that was lacking um, in the Glasgow governance was uh, um, a, a strong uh, input from the private sector um, and we've been uh, addressing that. Uh, the Glasgow Economic Leadership Board, no, the Glasgow Region Economic Leadership Board, there's a lot of very similar titles in organisations in Glasgow, um, which is chaired by Lord Hockey. Uh, that had been established, but hadn't really kind of taken shape and its relationship with the Cabinet hadn't really taken shape. So that's something that we, we have now addressed. Um, Lord Hockey attended the last Cabinet meeting and we're going to set up a, 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 um, from the back of that a, a clear ongoing relationship whereby that element of um, the city region deal, that key deliverable, which is levering in that um, private sector investment, uh, will have oversight and external oversight um, from the cabinet uh, on, on progress in that matter. Um, and we also are continuing to strengthen the links with the Commission for Urban, e Urban Economic Growth, which is there to, to oversee and monitor our, our progress on inclusive growth. Okay. Okay, any other city region deals want to comment on that? Thank you, Councillor Graham Ross. You're welcome. Uh, in business cases at, uh, within the Highlands have to state how the projects will be managed and then the benefits and impact that they'll deliver from the outset before they can actually progress. And the programme manager regularly monitors that and moves things on. So I think that's a sort of process that we have within Highlands to ensure that it's, it's monitored and developed. So. Okay, any... Okay, no additional... Councillor Lang, thank you. Yes, I mean, obviously we are um, a similar position to not quite as far advanced as Glasgow, but you know we've uh, we've obviously had our committee up and running for some time, as uh, Mr. Sweetnam said, because it was uh, running in tandem with us actually signing up to the deal. So um, the business cases coming forward are obviously very important, and then the monitoring of that. But we're looking at setting up a dashboard that will highlight uh, the outcomes that we're trying to achieve so that they can be measured against it. But I think it's, as I mentioned earlier, it's about making sure that you've got a common framework in place, I think, which uh, both, uh, you know, the local authorities and indeed one in our case, and both governments can actually see what the progress is being made. And that, that will then allow you, if there are difficulties that perhaps Glasgow has experienced in some projects, that you can take early intervention action in order to make sure that uh, going forward, you are delivering on the outcomes that you're trying to achieve. Alexander Stewart, and, to follow up. And following on from that, do each project or each deal have a risk register? And if they do have a risk register, is that publicly available? So, risk registers? Yes. Um, and it, it is publicly available, although I'm thinking, um, as, I, as I think this through, I think it's probably publicly available in in that the papers, the cabinet papers and minutes are publicly available. So it would be as part of that rather than standalone. As it happens, um, because Kevin is relatively new in, in leading the programme management office and I'm relatively new in chairing the cabinet, we have been having uh, conversations recently about um, accessibility of information, um, how the website is, is structured, all that kind of thing. So I think that's an, a, a live issue about um, making sure that people know how to access that information. Um, but it, it is publicly available. Um, the, uh, the question at the moment is how accessible it yeah. is, and we want to make it as accessible yeah. as possible. I mean, it, it's the accessibility, and the, it may be restricted in some of the... Uh, are, are you identifying that that is the case? That it, no, that it, I, it's not restricted, but I suspect you would probably... You would, you would have to have a wee hunt at the moment for it. Okay. Um, so we want to get to a position where that's not the case, where it would be very easy to find. Um, and we think that's probably fairly easily done just through a restructuring of the, um, the, the City Region Deal website. Okay, thank you. Okay, so uh, Councillor Lang, uh, does the Aberdeen Deal have a, a risk register and is that available? Yeah, we... We do have a risk register, you'll be pleased to hear. Um, and the programme board goes through that risk 
register um, at meetings. They would escalate up any issues to the committee that was identified. Um, I think it is available publicly because through the programme management office uh, and the details that we have, but we'll just check to make sure that's accessible for people. But yes, we have got an eye on that. OK, what about the other uh, city region deals? Councillor McVeigh? Yes, we have a be learning from um, Glasgow's example of how to make those minutes <laughs> uh, as available as possible when we get to that stage. Um, our papers haven't been publicly circulated papers as of yet, but when we get to a point where the projects, uh, where the project management office um, has articulated what success for each of the projects looks like, and we can get to a point of populating the risk register at that point, then at that point the papers will be public. Um, and can I just say, once, once you get that lesson from Glasgow on how to do that, could all of you tell every other department of your councils how to make your websites more accessible? Because that would be really helpful. Um, other uh, region deals risk registers who have not taken yet? Uh, Mr. Robertson? Jim, we, we have a risk register. Uh, it is part of the reporting, so but it's not necessarily that accessible. Okay. Uh, can I just check, Graham, were you wanting to follow up? Briefly on that? Re really just uh, yeah. on, on the website, Convener. Yeah. Um, so I, I was having a look at the, the, the Glasgow one um, before before this uh, meeting, and um, it, uh, the, the information is, is scant, frankly. Um, there's very little there. Um, you do have to go hunting. If you want to find uh, minutes, reports of meetings, you have to go onto individual council websites. You actually have to know what you're looking for. It takes ages. Uh, the whole thing should be refreshed. It should be more transparent. And that actually goes for all the deals. You need to publish everything in one central place. I think we can multiply that by 32 for every local authority in the country, to be fair. But I, I think given our lining of, line of questioning has been about openness, transparency, accessibility, city region deals would be a pretty good place to start and getting that getting that spot on. That's very helpful. I don't think there's a question. I think there's a comment rather than a question. Uh, uh, Andy Whiteman. Thanks very much, uh, Convener. I just want to explore a little bit about, you know, additionality. What would have happened if we didn't have these um, city region deals? Uh, the National Audit Office in England um, did a, an analysis of the first wave city deals, and one of the things they noted was difficulties in, ex in assessing what would have happened without the deals in place. Now, clearly, some of the projects you're talking about may not have happened or may not have happened now, so there's a funding issue, uh, obviously. Um, but, Adam McVeigh, you were saying that, you know, papers haven't been circulated yet. We've had um, uh, witnesses here talking about a lack of transparency. So, clearly, the projects that are going through city-region deals are going through in a process that is less transparent than conventional economic development, as has been done by councils over the years. So I just wonder about um, that question of additionality. Can we genuinely say that these are projects that would never have happened anyway, if, even if it may have been at a slightly longer time scale? OK, uh, Kevin Rush. I, again, I think in a Glasgow context, so, so you touched on it, obviously funding was, was a major additional aspect for us. So I think that, that did generate additionality um, for us. What we had to ask ourselves when we put the programme of projects together was will these projects deliver additional economic growth over just what would, what we was modelled to, to achieve anyway? And that was a fundamental part that we had to ask ourselves in, in identifying what those projects were. So there is additionality that, that comes from funding, but we need to, as part of our... Um, as part of our deal, we anticipate there will be an additional £2.2 .2 billion of, of GVA from improved productivity from the, the Glasgow uh, City Deal project. And I think, in all honesty, without that, that injection of £1 billion of funding, we would not have been able to deliver that programme of activity. So the additionality, yes, comes from the funding, but I think the additional productivity improvements that will come from it would be genuine economic additionality as well. Councillor Aiken, did you want to add to that? Um, yeah, just to add, perhaps just... Um, a specific example of the kind of thing that uh, Kevin was talking about occurred to me um, as he was talking. So in Glasgow, one of the one of the investments that we are going to be able to make as a result of this is um, in uh, the key walls along the Clyde, um, which are in mixed ownership, but the council itself owns owns quite a lot of them, and a, quite a stretch of those are in poor repair or not as good repair as they should be. For a long time that's been a barrier to development and a barrier to uh, using land along the Clyde, whether for housing or, or anything else. Um, now, 
that it's been an aspiration of the council to be to to fix those key walls. The injection of the of this um, investment allows us to do that, but it isn't just a case of oh, we're just doing something that we would have done anyway. There, it genuinely will then trigger opportunities for economic growth, for development, for um, investment in, in housing uh, that we wouldn't have been able to do without that kind of key piece of infrastructure being addressed. Um, so, yes... It was it was a it was a need and has been a long standing need in terms of um, Glasgow's public realm. Uh, but at the same time, there is there is definitely additionality in there that is going to be triggered as a result of this particular investment. So additionality, Mr. Robertson, had you indicated you wanted to come in? No, but I can. Oh, no, no, you're okay. <laughs> Hold it there. Give you a chance to gather your thoughts. I wasn't trying to coerce yes, you to come in. Richard, speaking then. Just thank you um, on, on the additionality question. So be, before the event, and as as the, the program was being um, developed, we, we did ex ante modelling in terms of GVA impacts as well, um, and and that showed an uplift of annually of some 260 million gross value added. But the other the two points that make around additionality in in relation to city region deals would be um, timing additionality. So things are happening sooner than than they other, otherwise might. Um, and also the scale and, and the, the pace of it is, is happening sooner than, than otherwise might have been the case uh, with, without the city region deal. OK. Anyone else want to come in on that? Councillor McVeigh. I think that's accurate. It's about accelerating what, um, what potential there is in the economy. And our numbers show, I think, 4.3 billion in potential additional economic output. But there are projects that wouldn't have went ahead or couldn't have went ahead without that intervention. Our concert hall, which got £25 million formally through the city deal, could have languished as a project for decades and decades or just remained a project in paper uh, in perpetuity without that kind of intervention. Um, <clears throat> the skills money that we have, £25 million over five years, is something that's quite hard to pull in and quite hard to foster that kind of collaboration between partners unless you have something like a city deal that's able to pull it together. Um, things like the borrowing permission to build the houses that I was talking about earlier, about a quarter of a billion pounds worth of borrowing permission to give us that scope to develop that model, was directly as a result of the city deal. It's not necessarily to say that it couldn't have been taken forward in another, in another way, in another decision, but it was hooked onto a city deal and gave us that opportunity to grab and pull things together. And last, I suppose, because I, I wouldn't want this point to be missed, the city deal is one thing that happens and then there's a number of things that happen after it. And even looking at the concert hall example, as a direct result of partners, Edinburgh and the Scottish Government and the festivals in the city coming together through the city deal process, despite the fact that the UK Government wouldn't put any money to support our festivals through the city deal, there was an announcement, I think, just over a week after the formal, uh, the formal announcement of the city deal, um, which articulated £15 million pounds worth of support for festivals to take that development of uh, an intrinsically you know, central part of Edinburgh's um, economy forward and protect it and expand it. So the, the concept of the accelerator, not only that the city deal can generate, but the other things that the city deal pull in as a result of just happening, I don't think should be underestimated. Thank you. John Robertson, take you now if you want to. Well, I, I would just sort of build on that, which is it, it's it's the additionality comes from joining up the projects and seeing what else you can do with it and projects which aren't in the city region deal. But that takes work, so you have to identify those things. So a kind of sort of prosaic one is that we've got a road project. That road project like, well, opens up development land, it opens up affordable housing. If we link that to the skills and employability work, you start being able to have that joined up, those synergies with the project. So that's where the additionality can come from. But it doesn't just happen. You can have 11 projects that will run and they'll be governed properly. You need to do that work outside and add that ad additionality ourselves and with partners. Andy Whiteman, do you want to follow up on that? Okay, no, that's that's that, that's helpful. I think obviously we are we are at a very early stage in all of this, um, and um, some of the answers to these questions may not be readily apparent just now. So I just want to move on to the question of monitoring um, and evaluation and how that's handled. So uh, you're all local politicians with officials uh, with you, obviously accountable to your electorate uh, for the decisions you make and the money you spend, but. City region deals have funding from the Scottish Government and have funding from the UK Government, both of which are executive branches of government. 
um, to which Parliament holds them to account, but they have a monitoring and evaluation role as well. So how is the monitoring and evaluation of the whole programme going to work to make sure that not only is public money being well spent, but there's sufficient scrutiny by taxpayers on this, and by that I mean your local residents who hold you to account in the normal course of events through local government, but may feel inhibited in doing that, or there may be conflicts because some of the money that you're spending is not money to which they can hold you to account because it's coming from the executive branch of government. Okay, certainly no one's desperate to answer that particular question. Councillor Graham Ross. I, th I think with any uh, level of spend within our local community, regardless of, of who it's uh, done the expenditure, local councillors are often seen as being you know, right at the heartbeat of, of what happens there. So we have to have a, a level of scrutiny and uh, information uh, available to, uh, and to be able to justify these sorts of decisions as well. Many of the projects here, I think, have been developed over a period or that we have in the, uh, the city region deal have been developed over a period of time and I think there has been a, a great deal of scrutiny. And I think we're very keen to support some of them, which are quite imaginative and will keep you know, people within uh, local communities involved as well. So I think there's, you know, it, it's very much at the heart of what you do as a, as a councillor anyway in terms of being accountable and open. Uh, Any other thoughts so. in relation to that monitor? I, I put on the public record earlier, obviously, Audit Scotland are, are, are doing a piece of work on this, Kevin Rush. Specifically from a Glasgow point of view, we, are, uh, we have a first gateway review in 2019, as Councillor Aitken mentioned earlier on. So that is where we need to demonstrate to both governments that, one, we know what we're doing, um, two, that we're investing in the things that, that we said that we would and, and in the way that we would. Thirdly, we need to demonstrate some economic impact, but I think everyone accepts, and I, I noticed this was, was mentioned last week, it'll be too early in 2019, so I think the guidance we've had from the governments is that a lot more interested in what process we've gone through and, and are, we, are we investing at the level that we said we would, so the monitoring spend on that. Um, we are part of the first cohort who have been evaluated at Gateway Review 1, so that's 11 uh, city deals in, in the UK. And a uh, local evaluation framework we brought through to Cabinet in February, which will demonstrate exactly what we're going to be measured against. So that will be publicly available in terms of what's been measured. The, the people who have been taken on to do the Gateway Review 1 will then make recommendations to ministers <coughs> based on, is Glasgow fit for purpose? Is it, is it doing what it, what it said that it would? And again, that will be developed in a kind of open and transparent way. Mm -hmm. the, the bigger issue, not the bigger issue, an, an equally big issue, but Gateway Review 2, I think, for us, which is what releases the next tranche of funding, I think there would certainly be an expectation from both governments at that stage they would start to see the economic impact of this flow through. OK, any additional comments on that line of questioning? Uh, Councillor Lang. Thank you. Um, my experience is my local residents don't have any problem with holding local councillors to account on a number of levels, but um, I suppose it's it's what we talked about earlier. It's it's whether the the public feel engaged with the process of city deals, and I suppose the onus is then on us as local politicians to make sure that we get that information down to the to the level of residents so they can see the correlation. But you know, um, because of the financial challenges we have in local government, I think. Um, you know, I don't think there's anybody around the table that wouldn't want to make sure that the money that is coming through city deals for projects is being spent in the best way and is actually returning the best impact for our for our communities. And um, so it is about the scrutiny and governance. I think that we have uh, within the committees and at lower levels um, that that's feeding through and we're keeping track of that. But it's also about the other reviews that are carried out by you know Scottish Enterprise, the Skills Development Scotland review that's happening to make sure that the projects that are being brought through as part of the city deals are actually delivering on the outcomes that we're trying to achieve in Scotland as a whole. Um, and, you know, it's that partnership and collaboration working that I think we'll, we'll see that through and hopefully make sure that um, our residents are satisfied with the, uh, you know, how we are moving these things forward. Thank you, Councillor Lang. Uh, Andy Whiteman, anything additional on that? Uh, thanks. No, that's, that's some useful comment there. I just want to move on to a couple of questions that are focused on the Edinburgh one, but have general applicability. In the English city deals, um, they were basically a deal that said, uh, the UK government said, here's here's some money, um, and uh, if you agree to, to, to spend this through a city deal, you can get some improved government, metropolitan mayors, uh, etc. In Scotland, there's been no trade-off like that, as I understand it, although in the Edinburgh case, I know that Edinburgh was, I think, interested in having the powers to levy a, a tourist levy. Uh, I'm just wondering how those kind of discussions went 
Um, and was that just ruled out as just not part of what city region deals are for, putting aside the merits of the argument? And the second question is that um, we heard evidence last week that you know. Stick with that first one just okay, now, we'll do that because I know that other members want to come back in with specific questions in relation to the deals that relate to their areas, and I certainly I'm, I'm, I'm one of those those MSPs. So uh, I know there's a general question there about deals to be done and what the nature of city region deals look like, but specific to Edinburgh, Councillor McVeigh, trade offs, deals, discussions. In, in terms of the specifics around revenue raisers, and Edinburgh has for a number of years been um, looking for a vehicle, whether it's a city region deal or anything else, uh, to take forward a transit and visitor levy. Um, Andrew may be better to answer, as I'm only five months old as a council leader, and Andrew was in the room for those discussions to answer the direct point, though. So, I, uh, the, as part of the deal, we decided that transit and visitor levy and, and those type of things were not going to be part of the city region deal. That doesn't rule it out entirely, of course, and there's still ongoing discussions between, uh, and not just Edinburgh, actually, several cities uh, about, uh, about whether um, a transit and visitor levy or similar. Um, some revenue raising powers are, are, are given as part. What I would say, though, is, and if we go back to the additionality point, is that city deals generated the discussion. And I think, actually, our ability to talk around those quite um, naughty issues and difficult issues uh, has been enhanced both with government and local government and governments and local government uh, uh, about those things. And the city deals in Scotland have been significantly different. I, th I think some of you will know that I, I was also part of the English setup up um, just prior to coming to Edinburgh. And um, they were on the back of um, actually taking over powers, particularly over things like the health service, etc., cetera, and the English setup, where Scotland has been about mainly economic growth and, and driving economic growth right across all the city deals, whether that's been from Glasgow right through to the more recent ones. And, and that's been the difference. So what I... What I think has happened is that, of course, not everything could be done in a city deal, but actually it's generated discussions to enable us to have an ongoing discussion with both governments on those issues. And then my apologies, I think I might move on from that because we need to allow ongoing discussions and other themes within city deals, but it is an opportunity to place on record uh, a view we heard in, in Paisley the other day. I think it's the appropriate time to do it because there's a line of questioning around uh, uh, additionality. Um, and the discussion we had on Monday in the Glasgow City Region deal was about displacement effect, particularly around the, the advanced manufacturing base around Glasgow Airport, um, and making sure that, that that you know businesses that were attracted to that area wouldn't just have set up somewhere else anyway. We we had that discussion, but it's an opportunity to put on record uh, a gentleman, Stuart Wild, that, that that we spoke to, who runs Red Renfrew Victoria Youth Football Club, who was at the the, the community panel I was talking to who showed me a map of that area uh, and there's a deprived community that sits right on the outskirts of that particular advanced manufacturing area uh, and there's some derelict and vacant land around that site and their question was well if we're doing a coordinated regeneration of that part of Glasgow City region where does his community and his club sit in there. So under the, the guise of, of the opportunity in relation to displacement and additionality, I just put that on the record. Mr Brush, I don't need you to give me an answer to that just now, but I think it's important when we speak to members of the community at events like that, they actually see their comments reflected uh, in, in, in these evidence sessions. So I took the opportunity to do that. Uh, move on now, Kenneth Gibson, MSP. Uh, thank you very much, convener. Good morning, everyone. I'd like to congratulate you on your submissions, which are all uh, very interesting. Although I note that Glasgow City Council states that Glasgow City Council is already the powerhouse of the Scottish economy. And Edinburgh City Council says the capital city region already drives Scotland's economy. So no unanimity there, no doubt. Uh, Councillor Lang will think it's Aberdeen. But I want to actually touch on our visit on Monday as well, because it was, it was a, a real issue which, uh, which uh, grabbed my attention. It was about the proposed £144.3 million light rail link. Um, and I'm not arguing for or against that. That's, that's not what I'm going to ask about. But what concerned me is, and, uh, um, is that uh, they were talking about delivery of that project in 2025, and I said, why is it eight years away if it's uh, more or less broadly been agreed? They says, oh, well, it'll take 18 months to build it, but approvals are going to take four years. 
Now, this, I think, and, and, and Councillor uh, David Ross is smiling there. I mean, clearly, if these um, projects are going forward at a time of economic challenge to try and deliver additional prosperity to Scotland, surely there must be a way in which um, these approvals can be expedited uh, in order that we can actually deliver on the ground much quicker. So I'm just wondering if members of the panel can talk about how we can improve that process and if there are any other bottlenecks that we could... Uh, we, 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 could, we should be able to overcome uh, to deliver these deals on the ground uh, much more expeditiously. A really helpful question. It's only fair, I think, we start with Glasgow City Region deal, given that that, that, that was cited. Who would like to come <laughs> on that? <laughs> Councillor Aiken. Um, kick off on that, but I'm sure Kevin will have some say on this as well. And I think there are... Uh, one of the, the things that um, the deals allow us to do is uh, align um, national... Uh, organisations, whether those are um, national agencies uh, or um, uh, other mechanisms that we require for, for delivery uh, it, and get us working together on these things. So it, I think there's a possibility that assumptions that are made early about how long these things might take, um, if we use the opportunity that um, the creation of regional structures and regional partnerships, which is I think is in itself um, one of the additionalities of the, the city deals um, is that it has facilitated the creation of, of regional working, um, that we use that opportunity to then work in a regional way with national agencies, national delivery bodies, um, and, and align uh, then we may actually be able to expedite some of these things. Maybe just one example is... Um, my colleague, uh, Councillor Tony Buchanan, who's the leader of East Renfrewshire Council, um, leads on behalf of the Glasgow City Region um, a, a, a team working with the utilities companies. Um, and utilities obviously absolutely crucial when it comes to particularly um, urban infrastructure and public realm. And it's, it's certainly something that we're encountering in Glasgow. Uh, and they've come to an agreement um, about working together, the utilities companies and the Glasgow City Region, uh, to help to expedite issues when they arise within uh, build projects, within infrastructure, to try and make sure that they're, they're not barriers um, and that they don't stand in the way for a long period of time. Now, it doesn't mean that you know things are going to be just dealt with um, immediately, but hopefully it means that um, on, on a whole number of, of projects uh, within the overall programme, um, building those kind of working relationships and coming to agreements um, on shared priorities means that we'll be able to shave time off um, some of the initially assumed timescales as we go along. And um, I don't know whether you want to add to that, Kevin. Um, Sorry, can I just add in, in there? Actually, because like, Councillor Aitken did say in a quote that there's a window of time for delivery of projects um, if we're going to be uh, moving them forward. But what, what, what we were told at the meeting was that the bottlenecks were uh, Transport Scotland, um, Network Rail and Scottish Ministers on that specific project. Now, it doesn't seem to me beyond... Although it's, so it's not necessarily within the, 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 the regional local authorities themselves, it's these external bodies and how he lays with them. But... I find it bizarre that, uh, that approvals would take four years just to get three th three groups effectively round the table along with the, the local authorities themselves. Oh, you want to come in now? And I think, Mr. Mr. Bush, I think if there's a role our committee can play in helping coordinate some of those agencies along with Glasgow City Region to make that more efficient and more productive, I think we'd be keen to do that. So, Mr. Rush, maybe you could outline a bit more. I think just in, in relation to the, the airport access uh, project, I think for clarity, I, I don't think the suggestion was that Scottish ministers were the bottleneck. I think there was a suggestion from, from Ren Fisher as lead authority that there was a ministerial working group uh, which is chaired by the transport minister, which I think brings together the various partners uh, to try and uh, work through these uh, solutions. I think Councillor Aitken's point about the infrastructure group is, is a good one. I think that's where increasingly we'll be able to ask each. And, and the initial summit that we had in September had chief exec level from all the utilities companies. They've now appointed kind of senior officers who will work at a city region level to try and coordinate investment and, and do exactly what's what's been suggested there. So I think just, just for clarity, I think it would need to be clear that we, we do, uh, Renfrewshire weren't suggesting ministers with a bottleneck. Actually, that there was a, a mechanism there for them to try and 
work through the agencies. In, in actual fact, I would say ministers have been um, have been facilitating. Scottish ministers have been facilitating partnership working um, on on that particular project. Anyway, through that national working group. That, but that's not what I was told at the airport. But well, well, I, I don't think we should. Sorry, sorry, sorry Mr. Gibson, <laughs> just a second because we all had recollections of what we heard during that meeting. Um, I think what would be helpful would be if either Councillor Aiken or Mr Rush uh, would write to the committee, explain what the challenges are in getting a delivery date ahead of 2025 yeah. and how this committee can support uh, addressing some of those challenges to speed up that process. If it is capacity within Transport yeah. Scotland requiring additional resources, let's see if we can focus the minds of all the partners to make that happen, because that was my reflection of the discussions okay. that we had. I wonder if Mr Rush or Councillor Aiken could maybe uh, be helpful to do that. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Right. I'm more interested in hearing about the bottlenecks from across. Yeah, the, well, generally, across apart from take the project away. And look that's at what I was hoping we'd get to. Uh, yeah. So, Councillor David Ross. I mean, <laughs> you're talking about a rail link. Uh, I mean, that rings a bell, and Jenny Gilruth will be well aware of, of that, about the, the, the leaving rail link, which, again, has, I, I think, in our experience, has been bottlenecked since the first um, STAG, Scottish Transport Vice Guidance, in 2008, another one that was produced uh, and, and has got mired down in the, the processes of Transport Scotland and having to check things and, and goodness knows what, and then missing dates and a complete lack of clarity about who is responsible for what in, in that whole setup. Uh, and that's one of the projects we actually, you know, initially put in through the, 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 the city region deal um, during the discussions with, uh, I believe, um, uh, officer and civil servant level, it was becoming clear that the full project wouldn't go, go in, but certainly the first stage of that was put in and it was turned down. Now, I, I think there, there are kind of the general issues about Transport Scotland and the way we do that, and I know the, the pipeline approach um, is supposedly dealing with some of those. But I think one of the concerns and the link to, to city regions is what we can't have, uh, you know, is uh, you, things go through the processes and the governance of a city region and then they have to go back into a whole new set of things and that, that's going to delay things uh, in, entirely. So, you know, if the national agencies, particularly where they have a role, can actually play a part round the table uh, in getting this sorted out, within the city region frameworks, I think that would streamline things considerably in the future. Councillor Ross, that, that's helpful. It's worth pointing out, in my memory of the discussions we had on Monday, Network Rail was also one of the key players in relation to this. That's worth yeah. putting on the table as well, rather than singling out no. one, one specific partner. Councillor Lyon, in a moment I'll take you in, but it's only fair because I know that Jenny Gold is a specific line of questioning and some of the stuff that Councillor Ross mentioned to, to take this question just now. We'll come back to the rest of these answers in a moment. Thank you, Convener. Um, David Ross, I do kind of want to go back and explore a little bit more about the Leaving Metro Link. It, it won't surprise you. Um, you will remember on the 14th of August, actually, last year, uh, no, sorry, earlier this year, I wrote to yourself, I also wrote to uh, David Mundell, and I also wrote to Keith Brown, the Cabinet Secretary uh, for the Economy. I received responses from the Scottish Government and the UK Government. I haven't yet received a response from Fife Council, which is disappointing. And I highlighted specifically the Leaving Mouth Rail Link as a, a missed opportunity, really, for my constituency, but for Fife specifically. Um, and we've heard a lot of evidence today about feeding the cities and driving that investment and growth, but it doesn't really feel to me that this is a city-region deal. Uh, it feels to me that it's a city deal and that the, the region, as it were, of Fife has been um, adversely affected to some extent because there are not specific projects identified that I can point to in my area, for example, that have benefited from it. So um, the Edinburgh region deal itself was welcomed by Fife Council on the 20th of July, but by the 26th of July, you said, I am disappointed by the level of funding directly focused on Fife. Um, I wonder what changed in that period? And somewhere within that, if you address blockages within the system as well, that would be helpful. Um, nothing changed within that, that period. I think, I think the two things are not necessarily contradictory. Uh, I'm absolutely committed and believe that the city deal um, framework and the approach that we've got is absolutely right and will be a great benefit to Fife as to the rest of the region. What I was disappointed about was the, 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 the way that we came to that final decision and we got 24 hours notice uh, of uh, what was going in and what wasn't going in. 
um, there were a whole range of things that we thought would get funding or more funding that didn't. Um, at the end of the day, I think there are significant things in there, and I think you will see things in your, your constituency, uh, particularly the, 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 the sites, the premises, and the office new build that we've got, which is a particular issue in, um, in Glenrothes for renewal of those, those sites. I just note, I mean, you, you wrote to me, I, I think I've tried to phone your office on a number of occasions. I think I spoke to you at the gingerbread event as well about getting together. You, but you've, that's, you've, you've, you've now put that on okay, the record. Yeah. <laughs> so the committee, I mean, yourself okay. and Ms. Gilruth will be interested in that exchange. But what the committee's interested in is, Sorry, is you had mentioned a blockage in relation to the specific project that Jenny Gilruth mm -hmm. had mentioned. So is there an, I hope this is helpful. Ms. Gilruth, but is there an interaction between those blockages and whether that featured in the final deal or not? Because the question, the substantive question Mr Gibson was asking was about blockages within the process. I suppose as well it's about prioritisation and, and uh, in the evidence we heard last week, Chris Day from Transform Scotland said one would have thought that as a partner in the deal, Fife Council would be hammering on the door in terms of the Leaving Mouth uh, Rail Link. So my question really is, where are you hammering on the door? How was it prioritised? You know, was it identified as the number one priority for, for five, for example? Yeah, I, I would say we've been been hammering and hollering and goodness knows what to, to actually get on the table with yourself. And as you know, I mean, there is there is complete um, cross party and cross community support for that leaving mouth rail link uh, in in the local area. And I think we've been doing our best. I mean, that was one of the things. My understanding, and I'm, I'm obviously not involved in the the. the the detailed prioritisation was the clear understanding we got from government government officials was that that would not meet uh, the the kind of specific criteria they were looking for in that um, in that deal. We did insist that at least funding for the first stage and the feasibility work uh, uh, went in there. Um, I think just on the wider issue the, the 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 issue and the disappointment around that was that the, the fact that okay we 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 clearly got uh money and allocation in the innovation bit for the the the, the sites and the premises and the office um renewals um but we didn't get um any money around transport that we had looked for we didn't get as much around the and skills. i apologize can I just finish? Ross, but you can yes if it's brief very, very briefly, mm -hmm. and, and the, the conclusion of that, and I think it has got more general thing, was it, it brought into question whether I, I think at civil service level that the, the civil service, particularly in the Scottish Government, but you know down in Westminster as well, actually get the connectedness of all these things. Um, you know, that you, you get one, one part funded, but not others, and they're actually very integrated and connected. Right, just a little bit of housekeeping here. Jenny Gorruth, because there's a strong constituency interest in a moment, I'm going to bring it back in for a very brief question. But Councillor Ross, I'm just checking, because right at the start of this evidence session, I asked a very specific question about whether Scottish or UK governments had said no to specific projects, and you never mentioned that particular project. So no. a bit of clarity would be helpful. Was, 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 was that a straight no? No, I think it. I think again, it's part of, part of. My no, I'm not. Here. So I'm not so I apologise. The, the answer not, here. So, sorry, Councillor Ross. Councillor Ross, Councillor Ross, if you could listen to the question been asked, okay? Yeah. The question been asked is: you were making a suggestion there that you were not allowed to proceed with that project, and earlier on in the evidence session, I gave the opportunity for all city region deals to tell me of specific projects they were simply not allowed to progress with. Councillor McVeigh has now given two examples of those projects that, that Edinburgh couldn't proceed with. I'm just asking you, is that a specific project, yes or no? Straightforward question. Uh, it's in the same in the same vein that through the prioritisation process... Right, we're not getting an answer, Councillor McVeigh. Uh, sorry, Councillor Ross, we'll just move on. Jenny Gorruth, very briefly. OK, very briefly then. Uh, in the context of Fife, uh, Fife specifically sits with uh, in between geographically uh, the Edinburgh City Region deal and also the Dundee one. Um, for some reason, the decision was made to split Fife. So North East Fife, the electoral uh, 
constituency uh, is being put in with Dundee and the rest of Fife has been lumped in with Edinburgh. I don't know why. Um, I believe it's to the detriment of my constituency, which has got the highest levels of unemployment in Fife and also the highest levels of child poverty. When we talk about inclusive growth, it's pretty difficult for me, again, as I've previously said, to identify where that growth is going to come from if you don't have those transport links. Um, last week, we had Professor Duncan McLennan in from Glasgow University. And he said, we have to be careful about how city regions are uh, grounded. If there are exceptional areas that lie between two regions, we cannot just draw a line. Um, David Ross, I don't know if you can answer this question, but do you know why Fife was cut in two, as it were, in terms of the city region deals? I don't believe it's that simple. That there, there is simply a line. There are particular projects and particular things that fit more closely with the, the South East Scotland Edinburgh deal, others that fit more closely with the, um, the Tay Cities. And on top of that, and I think the point is well made, you know, the work that we've been doing around um, the closure of Long Gannett with Clack Manninger and Falkirk actually indicates there is there is a need for something in that area that isn't focused on city. So I, I don't think it is a firm line. And one instance of that is that actually through the Dundee uh, and, and Perth and Ross Angus um, partners, we're working something that wasn't in the first iteration of their city deal, but in terms of the rollout of the broadband, uh, we're, we're actually working with them to look at um, how we can improve that and put a bid in for the whole of Fife as part of that with those parts. Councillor Ross, that's helpful. My apologies for cutting you off there. My apologies to the rest of the, the witnesses and, and, and to other MSPs as well. I'm, I'm loath to deny an individual MSP a strong constituent's interest. I think that's a valid thing to, to push that forward. That's why we have committees of this parliament. But we did drift off the underlying question that Mr Gibson raised, which was about blockages in the system where deliveries could be pushed forward. And Councillor Lang was going to respond to some of that. My apologies, Councillor Lang. Thank you. Um, I mentioned in my opening remarks uh, around some of our transport um, you know, projects that we wanted to take forward. And uh, we'd been ha asked to delay the, the strategic um, uh, transport appraisals that we intend to carry out. I think it's very important. I think it was uh, Ms. Gilruth mentioned there about prioritisation and how you, uh, you know, reach that those decisions. And I think those assessments are key to that to make sure because many of the projects that we had were things that perhaps have been sitting around for some time. We need to make sure that they still remain priorities um, and in which order they come. Now, the importance, I suppose, around the, the strategic um, assessments is that we need to make sure that we're getting getting them into the national transport review that's carried out by Transport uh, Scotland so that we can, uh, you know, hopefully bid for that funding going forward. So, you know, that, that was the kind of point that I wanted to make. The other aspect, I suppose, is that, uh, you know, we had um, an ask within our city deal, which was around the cutting of the timing between uh, Aberdeen and the central belt by 20 to 25 minutes. Now, it doesn't sit within our deal, but we uh, had a package uh, um, from Scottish Government that came forward separately, which we have on, under a, um, a memorandum of understanding, um, which is 200 million towards that. I suppose from our point of view, um, we are keen to make sure that that's pushed on. Um, we've, we've heard that package of money being announced a, a few times over the years. Um, we obviously want to make sure that we're working with Scottish Government to ensure that money is actually invested. But it's also important to us as to where those improvements are made so that we reap the biggest benefit uh, for, the, for the North East in that respect. So I suppose it's uh, you know, trying to open that dialogue with Scottish Government and Transport Scotland around uh, you know, what their plans are for that. And we obviously want to, to make sure that we're working together in order to achieve that uh, going forward. OK, that's helpful. Uh, Councillor Ross, did you want to come in? David, uh, sorry, uh, Graham Ross, apologies. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure you're aware that the transport uh, coming from the Highlands and within the Highlands uh, is really very important for us. Um, Within the, the, the city region deal, a third of the, the project monies is towards a, a transport project and the infrastructure in that respect. And with some of the problems that we're ex, uh, experiencing is we'd, we'd like firmer dates uh, and, and, be, uh, and delivery dates to, so we can progress stuff as soon as possible, because that has an impact on other projects coming forward. So it's, it's with Transport Scotland, and it just needs a bit more impetus, I think, would be... A nice way of putting it. No, I think that's really helpful. Uh, before I, Mr Gibson wants to come back in to follow up on some of the additional comments before Mr Gibson comes back in. Okay. 
Okay, thank you uh, very much, convener. I mean, I mean, in, in Glasgow, we've actually seen um, a switch from growth per se to inclusive growth. And in your submission, you're looking to um, bring in £3.3 billion of private sector investment over the 20 years. I'm just wondering how the private sector has responded to that and what the impact has been. <coughs> um, I th very, very warmly, actually. I think one of the one of the good things about inclusive growth is that it, it challenges you to think about how you grow your economy in a slightly different way. It's not one or the other. So there is the growth element to it. Um, and I think within a Glasgow City region context, certainly the discussions that we've already had with the private sector through the Chambers of Commerce, etc., and other and Federation of Small Business and others, they welcome the, the focus on inclusive growth. I, I think. Uh, they're quite keen to ensure that we still generate the additional GVA that we will, but that that GVA or that additional economic growth is shared across the, the entire city region. I think I mentioned um, on Monday when we met that you know, Glasgow's economic growth over the last five, six years has been really pretty substantial. In 2014, we had 7% GVA growth, the fastest growing in, in the UK, but that wasn't necessarily shared with everyone. So I think the private sector are keen because this is their, you know, growing the, the, inclusive, uh, the economy in an inclusive way means that people are still using goods and services, they've got more money to spend in, in local economies. So certainly in the discussions that we've already had with the, the private sector, they are fully supportive of this approach. Yeah, I just want to see if other local authorities are, are, are of the same view in, in, going, in going forward with the inclusive growth, how, what kind of discussions have had with the private sector and how it will impact, if at all, in terms of projects uh, delivery going forward. In terms of the civils, yes, they, they, they are keen to discuss about bringing it, particularly in terms of schools and employability, and what they can do in terms of both community benefit, but also it's, we have a school shortage. So if we can get to those people that are furthest away from employment, um, it's to everybody's um, benefit, and including and that civils and construction, but also in the Highlands, the tourist industry has a dearth of um, skilled work. So if we can get to those people that are furthest away from employment, if they can support that as part of the city region deal initiatives, they're all in favour of it. Any other comments in relation to wedding inclusive growth? Uh, Richard, speak now. It, just, just to add, um, w in Aberdeen city region deal, we too are engaging with the private sector. Um, Councillor Lang touched on community benefit clauses, but where, where those projects can look at targeted recruitment and training, then it's part of our deal agreement that we will try and... Um, uh, put that into our procurement of the projects um, and, and working with the private sector. Um, and, and also just to reiterate the aspiration, of, particularly around some of the key industries for, for Aberdeen City Region and, and, and Scotland and the UK, is embedding the aspiration in our schools, um, uh, particularly around the innovation piece. Okay, any additional comments on that? Okay. Do you mind I was just going to ask a, a, another point. I mean, I'm the only MSP in this committee who doesn't have a, a, a constituency that's part of a city regional deal, certainly not as yet. It's also got the second highest unemployment in Scotland. I'm just wondering what the displacement effects you, you perceive in terms of city region deals are in terms of resources and uh, indeed skilled people from areas that are not included in deals of you. I mean, although Glasgow may be accelerating its growth, is do you feel that's... that's um, on top of any growth that Scotland would be experiencing anyway, or is it just simply not just displacing it um, uh, from within the city, but actually from areas outside the city that don't actually um, have a, a deal status and therefore the benefits that accrue? Okay. Uh, uh, Councillor McVeigh. I think the nature of Edinburgh City Deal, the, the lion's share of it was on innovation and, um, and technology, and that isn't something that will be cannibalising the, the research funding or anything else of other universities. It will be genuinely creating an internationally renowned centre of excellence. Our private sector, just to kind of tie that in with the, the previous question, is responding to that because they know and they're already anticipating what the impacts will be. So they know that they're going to need additional startup business space, for example, out of that uh, investment in technology and innovation within the universities because they know there'll be people developing ideas through that process and then come out and want to take that on a much bigger scale and I would anticipate not only that being a, a huge benefit to Edinburgh not every startup will be able to afford or uh, want to be centred around or near the university campus even though that's where um, their technology might have might have originated so the fringe benefits accelerator again um, of that, I think, will push out, it, instead of it being a cannibalisation, if you like, 
of investment. I think yeah. it'll be a positive ripple effect and people will see uh, Fife and West Lothian and further afield as the natural place that they can go and start their businesses, their factories, their centres of creativity, their centres of technology, um, because startup companies don't have a huge amount of money to pay the, the prices that often Edinburgh uh, charges for its office space. So I think that's a prime example where the arrows will go in the other way and the ripple effects will be positive, not a hoovering up of investment within city deal areas. An apology for the answer for this question, but I'm keen to move on. We've got about 10 minutes left. Um, I just want to check on, on, on outcomes uh, just a, li a little bit more. Um, so the Glasgow's, I'll, I'll, I'll give this reference to Glasgow, but I'll open it out to to, to all, all witnesses. So Glasgow, the hope is 29,000 permanent jobs through and towards the end of this process. I think it's about 11,000 in the construction phase. I can't quite remember that that total. Uh, Councillor Aiken, I think you mentioned that the hope was that a lot of a lot of this activity would benefit those in the bottom 25%. Uh, I don't know if that's income deciles or SIMD, but the bottom 25% of uh, struggling in our communities, if, if you like. So is that a direct target for those 29,000 jobs? So as we go through that process, uh, first of all, I would ask, is there a benchmark? In year five, would we expect to identify 2,000 jobs? Year 10. So what are the benchmarks in reaching these 29,000 jobs or the 11,000 in the construction phase? And what percentage of those jobs would you expect to go to those out with the labour market currently? What percentage of these jobs would you maybe expect to go for those who were on lower skilled jobs and trained up to take opportunities that are available to make sure that those in that bottom 25% benefit. So how will those outcomes be measured going forward? I mean, that's one Thanks of the things the that we're, we're working with the, the, the Commission for Urban Economic Growth to, to develop um, those criteria and um, a kind of diagnostic approach. Uh, so that we, we, we can judge the uh, outcomes of the city deal on precisely that basis. Um, I mean, we've got, um, and through the work that, that Ken's team are doing, we do have a, a, a strong understanding of the issues in the Glasgow city region and, and probably um, particularly the city of Glasgow within that, uh, in that we, we are aware that, um, you know, it, and it's it's... It's a long-standing issue that the the numbers uh, of people who are uh, distant from the workforce for whatever reason, often it's um, to do with uh, long-term conditions, uh, disabilities, um, or uh, lack of skills and uh, qualifications and inability to access work, uh, that that has to be um, a key focus. And that if we advance in the, in the city region deal and that we're not addressing that, we're not seeing a difference in that, um, then that that would be a problem. Um, Kevin already mentioned the, the the levels of economic growth that Glasgow experienced um, in 2014, for example, that were, were very high um, and performed very well in comparison to, to other UK cities. Uh, but the impact on those statistics and um, what wasn't seen that you know it didn't we, we that didn't move we still had the same percentage of um unskilled and unqualified uh, people in the city who were distant from from the workforce and uh, so it's, it's absolutely understood that that has to be um an impact that we see it has to be one of the uh, uh, you know the main outcome perhaps um over the longer term what we're trying to do now um, and actively working on um, is precisely that developing an understanding of how we monitor that, what kind of targets we should be looking for, what kind of targets we should be setting ourselves, how we link, um, and again, the deal doesn't stand on its own, how we link uh, the work that we're doing through the deal uh, with, for example, the work that um, the academic sector in the city is doing, um, the university's innovation sectors, the um, additional work that we're doing in Glasgow to remodel um, economic leadership in the city, which does will have a particular focus on skills and employability um, and on key sectors um, and, and what we're doing um, within our schools as well, what we're doing in terms of education and bringing all of that together um, and all of that work together and understanding how that all interacts with each other to particularly focus um, on that bottom 25% um, and, and 
lift it up in terms of um, accessibility and, and the ability to access and the capacity to access the jobs that will be created as a result of okay, City Deal. So 29,000 new permanent jobs uh, anticipated. Um, if 25% of those were to go to those in the bottom 25%, that would be 7,500 jobs. There's a there's a start. There's a starter target for those new jobs that are created, mm. but as yet, you're st the city region is still working out what those targets should be. So, would you think seven and a half thousand is the starting point uh, in relation to those new jobs that are created, and when should we expect to see those targets emerge from the Glasgow City Region deal? I think it has to be looked at more widely than simply, an, you know, a particular number of jobs, um, because there's. It, it's about um, it's a particular type of jobs as well. We, we want people um, who haven't been able to do so up until now to have the ability to access high quality, secure, well paid employment as well. So it's not just any job, it's the quality of and, and the sustainability of the employment. So those those are it's so it's wider measures um, and that's that's what we need to understand. It's that how we evaluate that as we go forward that I think we need to so I, I think it's easy it's fairly easy to set a target and say X number of jobs or this percentage. But it, it the 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 issue that contributes the issues that contribute to um that twenty five percent uh, group are complex, so we need to have more complex responses and more complex ways of measuring it and okay. evaluating as well. Councillor Aiken, I fully appreciate the complexities around all of that, but at some point, this Parliament will wish to monitor the successful outcomes of each of these city region deals. Um, I would hopefully take it as a given that the 29,000 jobs that will be created will be good quality, sustainable, uh, high quality jobs. Uh, I fully appreciate that uh, some people will take those job opportunities by upskilling themselves and may already have been in employment. I understand that as well. But at some point, this committee, a successor committee, is going to have to ask the question, tell me how many jobs have been created, how many of those jobs have went to the bottom 25%, what's the strategy for achieving that? What's the timescale? And that's all still work in practice. So is, I'm going to ask the others for the job creation outcomes that they're seeking to achieve and monitor also. But when do you think we can anticipate a uh, Glasgow City region fleshing some of that stuff out? We're sorry, we're, we're we're doing it now. We're working that's that is the work that we're engaged in right now. And that is the the inclusive growth. It's it is fleshing out that inclusive growth aspect, working directly with and um, and we had um Professor McLean here last week, he's on the that commission. Um that that work is happening just now. And you know, Council uh, uh, Mr. Gibson had mentioned earlier that uh, I I talked about a window. That's the window that I'm talking about. That, you know, the window to have that understanding um of where we're going and have that criteria and have that evaluation. Um yes, twenty nine thousand jobs, that's the target. Within that as many as possible uh, in terms of, you know, we we want to make sure that, they, um, that, that as many people as possible have the capacity within the city to access and the city region to access those jobs. I suppose ultimately the outcome that we want to see is um, an, an ever shrinking of the percentile of the potential workforce in Glasgow, which has no skills or uh, qualifications and, and okay. which is furthest mm. from the workforce. So a shrinking of the gap between mm. people and jobs. Okay, thank you. It's also worth putting on the record that when the committee was in Paisley on Monday, we met what appeared to be an excellent community organisation from Yoker who had a skills remit in working with the uh, uh, local people actually across the northwest of Glasgow who were furthest away from the late labour market, quite often young people. And one of the things they were seeking from Glasgow City Council on this occasion was uh, the appointment of a support worker or a coordinator to grasp the opportunities created by the city region deal. And they made that point very specifically with myself within my group. As I said earlier on, there's no point in the committee engaging with community groups uh, in relation to inquiries if we don't put on the record some of the information that we received. So I, I, I'm sure Mr Rush will be aware of that particular organisation. Maybe that's something the city region could look at. Uh, everyone
everyone else, this will be your final opportunity to put some comments on the record. I'd very much appreciate any information you could give in relation to employability targets, high quality jobs, those furthest away from the labour market and the kind of targets and outcomes that you're hoping to see. But wrapped up within that, any other additional comments you wish to make, this would be your opportunity to do that. So maybe we'll start with uh, Councillor McVeigh. OK, I mean, our uh, jobs figures in a macro level, I think, was 21,000. But obviously, we need to do more work um, at this stage to work out the the private sector elements of that and um, and the structure of exactly how they're going to um, arrive in the in the region. Um, the one thing I would say that I think it is important to say um, is, and it follows on from um, Councillor David Rossi's comments about having 24 hours notice in terms of projects for our city deal. Both governments, by the nature of it, we would love it if it was a, a you know, an open process where you'd put a business case and everything could be considered on its own merits and therefore you could end up with a city deal of any number at any given time. In reality, it doesn't happen like that. Both governments have an idea at the start of the process of how much they are able and willing to put into the process. And it would have been really helpful to have had that information and that analysis as early as possible, rather than um, what was in our case in Edinburgh, the UK government scrambling around trying to find money to match uh, what the Scottish government was willing to put in. That was an unhelpful tail end of the process. And unfortunately, it was a process, the process, the process that I had to deal with and my predecessor uh, dealt with everything else. But, but it was unhelpful. And I think it didn't take us where... It didn't give us the opportunity, I think, to really look in terms of the overall envelope and apply the level of scrutiny and detail that we would want to the overall package of projects that we would have wanted to take forward. I think going forward for future deals, whether it's City Deal 2 for anyone around the table or new City Deals for anywhere else uh, or new region deals for anywhere else, I think getting both governments, if they are going to work together, to clarify exactly what their overall investment envelope is as early as possible in the process would be, I think, a huge benefit. Really helpful, and you took your opportunity for additional comments, and those are points very well made. Can I just check those 21,000 jobs? Will, will a breakdown emerge on how many of those will be targeted at those most income deprived areas? Yes, we'll have a breakdown when we do the full analysis of the impacts of all the projects. We'll break that down. OK, thank you. I don't know if uh, Councillor Graham Ross or John Robertson wants to... I, I mean, we, we have targets for school jobs. We have targets for people furthest away from employment. We don't have those interrelationships. One of the things that Councillor Lang said a couple of times, and we would really welcome, is a standardised view or at least standards within an economic dashboard which would help our thinking around that. So we're working with Glasgow Uni, Strathclyde Uni as well around that. But having a common view of that would help us, I would, and I guess it would help the monitoring of our progress as well. OK, Councillor Graham Ross, any final comments before we close the evidence session? Just I think that we're, we're very keen that the, the, the city region deal uh, works very well. Uh, transport and infrastructure within the Highlands is, is something that we have... You know, trying to keep people within the Highlands is, is very important to us. So this has given us a great opportunity to bring forward projects that may well never have been happened at, at all or would take an awful <coughs> long time. So while well, there's issues with it, you know, uh, and some of the progress might not be quite as quick as we would like, certainly there's been a, a significant benefit. I was keen to hear positive final comments. Thank you, thank you Graham Ross. Uh, Councillor David Ross. Um, in, in, in terms of the specific investment in um, sites, premises, offices and whatever, we're, we're estimating about 3,500 uh, gross jobs and probably when you figure in displacement, probably 2,275 um, around that specific part of it. Um, I think in terms of the, 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 you know, the involvement and getting people into the labour market, I think that, that skills investment plan that we've pulled together, uh, which has, has really lent the foundation of, of the work done through the city region deal with um, Skills Development Scotland um, is the basis for developing how that that part of those pathways will work. And just very briefly, I mean, I think it, um, reiterating some of the comments that Adam has, has made, I mean, I think um, quite apart from the projects, the, the work in relationships between the councils and the other agencies is a real benefit and added value and I think it will see us, um, you know, well into, into the future. <coughs> okay, uh, Councillor Lyon. Yes, um, we have a 
3,300 uh, net new jobs is, is our estimate. I think what we do have to bear in mind, because the plans are long term and the projects evolve, um, it's keeping a, you know, a, a check on whether those are accurate figures or not and just not assuming that that is what we'll get and then working off of those. Um, you know, it's obviously quite clear from the comments I made earlier that for us as a, in the North East and, and our uh, city region deal is that we have that embedded along with our regional economic strategy in the other aspects that we are in our day-to-day business in the council, particularly our local outcome improvement plans. And I think if we do that, then we will see the flow through, making sure that the jobs that we are creating are impacting on some of our most deprived areas, as well as uh, you know bringing the economic prosperity that we're all looking for. I would agree with Councillor McVeigh's uh, comments around it would be helpful, because you know we want to pursue a city region deal too. You know, I haven't made any, uh, um, you know, I've been quite public about that. And I think some of the things within our deal one will allow us to do that, bring the projects forward. But I think it is important that both governments give an indication of what is available on the table so that we as local authorities can make sure that we are prioritising the plans that we bring forward and we make sure that we maximise the benefits for our region from the money that's available. And uh, Richard Sweet, I don't know if there's anything you want to add to that before we... No, thank you. Okay. Now, now, I did see that was going to be final comments. And uh, uh, Andy Whiteman, um, I may just have to leave the question you now have hanging, but I would love, get, like to give you the opportunity to at least ask it in public session, and perhaps we could get a written answer. But it will have to be brief, I'm afraid. Okay, very, very brief. Okay. I mean, just building on what Jenny Gilruth and um, uh, Kenneth Gibson were saying in the sense of what does the region get out of this? Because we had evidence last week from, again, Professor McLennan and uh, uh, another witness as well, that, you know, Scotland's a country of towns. So for the Edinburgh South East, you know, what's there for Cowdenbeath and Kirkcaldy, for the Inverness one, what's there for Skye, uh, Fort William? Um, and there's a, certainly a danger that we overheat existing city economies um, to the detriment of the regional economy. Mm -hmm. So I just put that on the record. I mean, I think I, we're at very early stage in all this, and some of the reflections you've made have touched on that point, uh, and I think obviously we'll return to it in future. Thanks, convener. Okay, thanks. It's also a different question from the one I thought you were going to ask, but never mind. <laughs> uh, but there we are. That, that, that's committees for you. Can I thank everyone present? That's just over two hours we've had you here. We really appreciate you taking the time. Uh, and like we say, following up and writing, if there's anything at all you wish to... Uh, convey to us, please do so in writing. Let's keep that dialogue going and just thank you all for your attendance here today. We now move into private sessions. We move on to agenda item two. Thank you. Okay.